Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm Jeff Kelly Lowenstein, founder and executive director of the Center for Collaborative Investigative Journalism, or CCIJ. And I just wanted to uh, thank everyone for being here, for joining us at this tremendous conference, and for being here for what I'm really optimistic will be a stimulating, informative, and productive session. Um, I just wanted to first make sure that I thanked all of the panelists, <clears throat> pardon me, for joining us. Um, we have a tremendous group who I'll introduce in a minute. I really appreciate the effort and time uh, they've taken. I'd like to thank all of the folks doing the tech work at the AIJC. I know it's a very ambitious project this year of five different locations uh, live, and then also uh, coordinating the tech uh, centrally through WITS at, at Johannesburg um, and uh, Shireen Rubenstein and doing all the logistical work, Anton Harbor obviously leading it for many years. So, so uh, for me, the AIJC, this is now my, my seventh year coming here, and it's just a remarkable gathering of being, bringing people together all over the continent. And this particular session where we're talking about collaborative investigative journalism really speaks to the essence of what the center uh, is, is all about, CCIJ is all about. And in fact, uh, many of the people who will now hear from in the panel, uh, we, we, I met at CCIJ, uh, CCIJ as, as an organization came out of the African Investigative Journalism Conference. So I just wanted to thank everyone for being here, the organizers and all of our panelists. So I just wanted to uh, do a screen share for, for just a minute um, to go here. And then uh, this is our tip sheet and I'll, I'll put the key questions uh, in the draft so that everybody knows kind of where we're headed. Uh, thanks very much to Evelyn Gronick for really taking the lead and guiding us on this tip sheet. We'll, we'll look to make it available during the session but also afterwards. So here is where we're headed, the key questions that we want to address going into what is collaboration, what's come out of it, what are some of the challenges, what went well, how did we get through, are there specific conditions within the African continent and what kind of support is needed, and then moving forward into role of solutions, impact, innovation, and distributing the work, what's next. We've had some very interesting discussions about a Pan-African virtual newsroom, and then of course, uh, what we like to call vitamin M, how do we deal with funding, uh, and so on. So this is kind of the broad strokes of where we'll head. Um, I just wanted to also uh, take a minute and just show the website for uh, CCIJ, the Center for Collaborative Investigative Journalism. Um, here are a couple of the projects uh, that, we've, that we've worked on and are working on. The Gaming the Lottery uh, came out of uh, the 2016 Center for, uh, sorry, African Investigative Journalism Conference. And we launched uh, H2O Fail, our current look into access to global access to clean water at the, at the African Investigative Journalism Conference in 2018. So at CCIJ, uh, we really believe in bringing together data, visual and investigative storytellers as equal partners uh, from the beginning of projects to tell ongoing stories about key global issues. Um, we, we have a strong commitment to work with journalists who would not otherwise have a chance to do this kind of work. And we really believe in uh, working together to uh, provide training uh, uh, to journalists and a number of people on this call have actually uh, participated in our projects and as well as our training. So let me uh, get off of that. Um, let me just put the key questions in the chat. There we go. And so, so now we're all kind of on the same page. And then I just wanted to now uh, take a minute and introduce uh, our, our panelists. So uh, we have Sonia Smith uh, from Namibia. And Sonia is an award-winning journalist who's done a number of projects with CCIJ um, and writes for the Namibian, among uh, many other uh, publications. Sonia has also reached out to us around press freedom issues. Uh, we have Vanessa Offiong from Nigeria, uh, working at CNN with the As Equals Project, uh, worked for uh, Daily Trust before that, has freelanced for a number of publications, 
uh, throughout the continent and in other countries and continents such as Zam Magazine. Uh, we have Evelyn Gronick, uh, Managing Editor and Investigations Editor from Zam Magazine, a uh, tremendous uh, contributor who just did a huge project, was a key, really key figure in doing a huge project around kleptocracy and corruption throughout the continent. Uh, we have Steve Kretzman, the ed editor of Mother City News, and uh, Steve and his team uh, did a very important project um, around access to clean water, rivers of sewage. We worked on that together with CCIJ. Uh, we'll hear from that. We have uh, Jason Florio, a photographer from the Gambia, who um, is from England originally and uh, worked on a very interesting project called the Gambia's Water Paradox and also participated in the launch of our, our metaverse uh, project, which we'll talk a, a little bit about later. And then uh, we have, we're very fortunate to have Carolyn Lunga uh, from Zimbabwe and uh, an academic who uh, is studying these issues and, and really doing important uh, academic research uh, in the process of getting her doctoral, uh, her doctorate degree um, in England. And so she'll, she'll have that uh, perspective both as a professional practitioner for 10 years, but then also um, as, uh, as, as, a, as a burgeoning academic. So, so we really have a, a tremendous group. Uh, we're hopeful that Lamin Jahate, also from the Gambia, will join us, but um, I know I've kind of given introductory comments, so let's, uh, let's get right into it. And uh, the other thing that I wanted to say is that we do want this to be a conversation so if you have questions or something's unclear and so on, uh, please feel free to, uh, to put the questions in the chat. And we're really gonna try to run this as, as a conversation rather than having people give formal comments. Uh, we'll, we'll really sort of question and answer and cover the ground that we said we wanted to uh, address during the course of the session. So uh, thank you again. And why don't we uh, get started and um, Vanessa, can you uh, just start and talk a little bit about some of the collaborations uh, you've done uh, it, it, with CCIJ, but obviously with Zam Magazine and others? And you know, kind of what, what have they been? You know, some thoughts about what's what's worked, what's been challenging. Just kind of start us off, Vanessa. Then we'll go to some of the other members on the panel. Thank you so much, and we're so glad everybody's here. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you very much, Jeff. It's nice to be here. So um, I worked with Zam Chronicles under the term tutelage of Evelyn and um, with CCIJ, with Jeff. And um, I will start with um, CCIJ. We did, I, um, I worked with other journalists and we were looking at water issues surrounding COVID. And um, I decided to look at internally displaced people in Nigeria who were settled in Abuja, the capital, as a result of the Boko Haram insurgency. And um, this came about when I was looking through the COVID-19 guidelines that WHO had um, come up with. And I didn't think that it reflected the situations or the realities of internally displaced, displaced persons in Nigeria and generally. So first of all, washing their hands is luxury because they do not even have access to water, let alone water, um, run their hands under water for 20, 20 um, um, seconds. So what I did with that was to investigate government's failures with providing basic needs as they were um, hounding people to respect the COVID-19 guidelines. If you want people to respect those guidelines, what have you done as government? And this was at a time when monies were coming from left, right, and center to Nigeria. Individuals were donating, organizations were donating, charities were, were donating. What was the, where was the money going to? They were giving palliatives that were, were spoiled, foodstuffs that were spoiled, but overlooking the basic um, challenges that these kinds of um, vulnerable communities were experiencing. So that story, investigating that story, it drew the attention of the um, Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs to the particular IDP camps that I had um, reflected in my story, and then later on to other IDP camps. While the story did not necessarily generate the kind of impact I was hoping it would, in terms of actually providing portable water for these communities. It drew attention to other issues that they were going, going through in terms of um, healthcare access, 
and education for their children. Um, the last time I was there, this story was published in December. I was there maybe a month or two ago, and I was told that they had been coming regularly to visit those communities to ensure that children were being vaccinated and the women were going for antenatal care in hospitals that were much closer to them. So these are impacts that, I mean, are back, even though the water issue is still looming, is still looming there. I will go on to the one that I did with Zam Chronicles, which was um, selling your body to feed your children. It was a story that about eight journalists did across Africa, Nigeria, Liberia, Mali, um, Senegal, I think Congo, I do not, and South Africa as well. I do not remember what the other countries were. And we looked at how government failure was pushing women to sell their bodies, to tend to basic needs, like feed themselves, pay school fees, care for their elderly and parents, care for their children. The idea was not to stigmatize or condemn women for being prostitutes or living loose lives. The idea was to look at women who, if they had alternatives where, for instance, their aged parents did not have to make out-of-pocket payments to treat themselves when they were ill, to treat illnesses like diabetes or accidents um, 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 situations, they would ordinarily not be hanging around um, men like they were having to do at the moment. And um, for that story, I looked at um, women in Benin City where um, it's, it's, it's very common that you have women who are, who are going to Italy for prostitution. But the focus, I didn't, I, didn't go to come, uh, I didn't go to households or parts of that city where I was likely to find these women. I looked for women who had stayed back and I was, were asking them questions like, what are the pressures you're facing to take care of your families? And women were saying things like, well, I go to fetch water for my mother in a house where her neighbor's daughters had, had drilled a borehole. And my mother or my aunties remind me that it's somebody like me who did that for their mother. But I, I'm restraining myself. Rather, I've sought to have a boyfriend who lives abroad and can cater to those needs. It was the same in Port Harcourt, River State, where you have a large community of expatriates who are working um, and having girlfriends on the side. So you had girls migrating to those areas. But in speaking to them, you'd see that um, government's fa failures or the absence of basic facilities were pushing them to find means to meet those, those needs. And for a lot of them, once those needs were met, they stepped aside and tried to live um, regular lives. In, in um, Liberia and in Mali, you had women who had to sell their bodies to be able to get fish, which they were going to sell. So these were women who ordinar or ordinarily felt self-empowered, but were at the mercy of men who were not giving them these commodities to help them earn an income. It was the same with them, women who needed to pay house rents. And if they didn't have money or a condition for, for, for being given a house was to sleep with the landlords. So these were everyday issues that women were going through. And um, understandably so, because they, they, I mean, shelter, shelter is one of the basic um, amenities and basic needs of every, of every human being. So if you have, you're a mother or a single mother with children, you need to provide shelter for them. And if that was all what you had to do, they were left with no option but to do but to, to sell their bodies to have that need met. So basically, these were the stories that um, we did. It, 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 it provoked, this particular story is one that has provoked debate on different um, discussion platforms. And even at um, the last CCIJ um, conference we had, where we met physically, it was one that we spoke about on SABC during the conference. And for the first time, I think people like with my newsroom in Daily Trust, they took a step back, you know, to stop judging women. And that changed the way they reported a lot of the gender stories because we were there to say, don't blame the women. See the reasons for which they're making the choices that they're making and that there are alternatives. So that's an impact that it had in my newsroom. Yeah. No, th th thank you very much, uh, Vanessa, for starting us off and getting right into that question of impact and Vanessa's work is very distinctive, both because she has a very clear focus on women and gender issues and vulnerable communities. And also because particularly at that point, she was doing work both with Daily Trust, but also in an individual capacity 
and freelancing, I also wanted to mention that Vanessa, in terms of collaboration, has been extremely generous within our community with sharing opportunities, letting people know about different things that are available to them. And so one of the goals that I have from this session is that we think about all kinds of different ways to collaborate, that it can be on an individual story, it can be sharing opportunities. And then also, uh, we'll talk about this a little later, but Vanessa very bravely set out from Daily Trust and then want, went on her own as a freelancer. And we, we worked a little bit at CCIJ with her around working to get a different job opportunity with CNN, and she's doing tremendous work there. So thank you so much for starting us off, Vanessa. And I also wanted to make sure, uh, before we go to uh, Steve next, um, to, to thank Campbell and Itzhak for all the work that they've done throughout the week. So thank you so much, uh, Campbell and um, Itzhak. I also wanted to acknowledge that Lydia Namubiru, who is our new Africa editor uh, from Uganda, she's she's on on the conversation, and uh, so as well as Carolyn Rafaeli, a dear friend and colleague who for years worked with the Vitz Justice Project and did absolutely life changing work there. So we really have a rich group here. So uh, we've heard from uh, Vanessa starting us off, kind of talking individual freelancer in Nigeria working on women and, and, and children issues and talking about collaboration from that vantage point. Steve, uh, you're in Cape Town, you run a community newspaper, you have your own team. And then also we, you know, we, we, had, we did some collaborative work with CCIJ. Can you talk a little bit, Steve, from your vantage point about you know, the overall experiences, what collaboration has been, Vanessa got into impact, sort of things that have worked and not worked. Uh, please, your thoughts, Steve, thank you so much. Sure. Thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, the, the opportunities that collaboration brings are, are well, they, 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 they're very many opportunities. What, I mean, one of, the, one of the things that, so this, this project, Rivers of Sewage, came about when I had been reporting on sewage pollution in, in South Africa, uh, in, in Cape Town's water bodies for, for quite some time. And then through CCIJ, the, a, a grant was available and we applied and <clears throat> were successful. So, so what, it, what the collaboration allowed is, is for me to bring on board people who had, who had other um, abilities, skills, such as videography. So I could bring on board Peter Lohanga, who um, is very good at, at well, he's, he's trained in videography, which I know very little about. Um, which meant we were able to include a, a, a very hard hitting video segment in, in the reporting at the end of the day. And then I could bring on board someone like um, Nombulelo Damba, who's in the Eastern Cape, about a, a thousand kilometers away from Cape Town, to, to interview communities there to illustrate how uh, rivers were being polluted by untreated wastewater in various parts of the Eastern Cape. Otherwise, I would have had to go there, which would have ended, which would have cost in transport, would have cost in accommodation, and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> she's there; she could do the work, and then, uh, plus, the money from the grant gets spread further to other people. And then uh, we're able to bring on board Nompumelelo uh, um, Nsweni, who is a, is a, a great data analyst, who, uh, and her her skills could then be added into the mix skills which neither myself nor Peter nor Nombulelo had in order to, to scrape a very rich database, which is actually publicly available from the National Department's uh, Water and Sanitation Department. And um, <clears throat> using this, this data, which what it, what it is essentially is that all wastewater treatment works in South Africa, there's almost 900 of them across the country, have to test the, the, the quality of the effluent every month and send the results of these tests to the national department, which then publishes it on this, this data dashboard. So what we, what we have is this, 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 this uh, collection of data showing the quality of effluent across the country. And it was quite scary <clears throat> in that about 75% of these wastewater treatment works were failing in, the, in, in meeting the minimum uh, quality for for effluent, which which means that all all the rivers, and in cases along the coast, many cases um, very ecologically sensitive estuaries, were receiving this uh, 
this untreated or in, or partially treated in, in, in better case scenarios, but, but nonetheless still polluted, very, very much polluted uh, sewage. Um, so this, this enabled us to, to, to show by, by uh, Nombolelo in Eastern Cape, me around Cape Town doing a little bit of traveling outside of Cape Town as well to other cities, um, just how widespread this, this, this pollution and, and its impact is. Um, yeah, so the, the, the collaborate, you know, without the opportunity to do that collaboration, um, an individual journalist such as myself would have had to spend a lot more time, a lot more money doing, gathering this information. Whereas instead with, with, with a relatively small team of, of, of four, we were able to put together a very hard hitting story, which appeared in the national publication, Daily Maverick. And, um, generated a, a lot of feedback, uh, a, a lot of, a lot of uh, private companies who, who deal with wastewater treatment and pollution treatment then contacted uh, Daily Maverick and said, well, these, these are, are, are potential private solutions, which Daily Maverick then picked up themselves and, and, and reported on. And um, shortly thereafter, the, the National Department uh, committed to, to reinvigor reinvigorating it's blue and green drop reports. Now, these, these were reports which started in 2009, which were supposed to annually give an overview of the performance of the country's wastewater treatment plants, as well as their water treatment plants, which provide drinking water to communities, which stopped, they, they stopped producing these reports in about 2013. The last report was in 2016, but it wasn't a full report, it, it, and it wasn't really um, made public. It is publicly available if you look for it, but it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't broadcast. So their, their recommitment to, to uh, producing these blue and green drop reports came about a month after the Rivers of Sewage story was, was published. And I can't say for sure, but I like to think perhaps we had a hand in it. And um, it's also contributed to a growing public awareness and debate of the impact of lack of, of, of wastewater treatment and, and the failure of municipalities across the country to do so. And, and there's a growing groundswell. There's a lot of groups, public groups, uh, uh, citizen groups that have, that have, have started, such as um, a group called Armour Action for Responsible Management of Our Rivers on Facebook, which is 4,000 members and posts every day of, of, of citizens across the country posting um, incidences of, of, of municipal failure to, to treat wastewater and, and, and the resultant pollution. And um, a lot of other community newspapers and, and publications have been, have been steadily picking up on this, on this theme. So it, it, it's the Rivers of Sewage and this collaboration significantly contributed to that uh, growing public awareness. It, it, it absolutely did, Steve. And uh, thank you for sharing that experience of you know, working within the South African context and bringing in a, a real team uh, internally to deal with uh, producing a, a project that went far beyond what any one person might have been able to, to accomplish. And it, it has had that widespread stimulation of, of impact and dialogue and discourse and Daily Maverick uh, taking that forward. And so in, our, in that instance, CCIJ, we were able to provide uh, some, some financial support and also, we, we had different levels of interaction. We can talk about that a little bit later uh, in terms of helping a little bit editorially and a little, little bit uh, with the visual stuff. But it was really more Steve's uh, team driving and leading that project. So thank you very much for that, Steve. Sonia, uh, can, we, can we draw you in? Sonia, uh, coming from Namibia, we met at the AIJC two years ago. She put in a proposal, uh, did uh, two very impactful and, and award-winning uh, stories with us. Sonia also reached out around collaborating around press freedom issues. Uh, and we've worked together on, uh, Sonia has led one of our, our trainings recently. So uh, really kind of interacted in a number of different ways. So Sonia, uh, could you talk a little bit? And then before we just hear from Sonia, I just wanted to mention, we want to provide uh, the links and so on. So we, uh, Evelyn very helpfully put in one of um, the Nessa stories into the chat. I put the other one in that Vanessa shared, and then we also uh, put Steve's story, uh, Steve's team story into the chat as well. So, Sonia, over to you and, and some of your thoughts and experiences with collaboration, please. 
Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Jeff. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, my collaboration journey um, started in 2019. Uh, uh, basically, at this very conference uh, when I met Jeff. Um, um, so then when I got back uh, home, what I did is that I, 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 I put in some proposal because they called for pitches on waterless or water projects. Um, and uh, so I joined the CCIJ and um, so far I have been uh, lucky or been a recipient of funding where I did two projects with the CCIJ uh, on water projects. One was uh, the dying for a drop um, that basically involves um, a, a community of sand people um, who were struggling with access to water. Basically, they did not have uh, water at all. So they were forced to go to length uh, to access uh, 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 or collect uh, water from, um, from the villages' uh, walls. Um, one of the other um, uh, um, um, challenges or, or concerns um, that they have also faced was um, the fact that um, um, most of the families that of, of, of this community they have they have lost their loved ones, brothers and and, and, and and children actually in the wars that they are forced to go to in excess of clean water. Um, the second project was um, um, a story about um, uh, farm workers um, that are working on the grape uh, vineyards um, where um, they are also in, not having uh, access to water, but um, um, you know the the the, the, gr the crops of, of these grapes are actually well tempered, but and they are bringing in a lot of millions. And so far, uh, the country Namibia has actually um, uh, made profit of about you know a, a 900 millions uh, in, in 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 shipping of, of of grapes to other countries such as the UK, uh, Netherlands, and so on. Um, um, a, to sell the grapes, but the employees are basically uh, suffering, no access to shelters, no access to water at all. Um, and uh, some of them, they were actually forced even to drink from the rivers. And uh, these are dirty waters where they, 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 they also, um, it, it's not clean water at all. And the other challenges that we were facing also, they, they live in untouched houses where um, basically they, they, there are no amenities at all, such as you know, um, proper to to uh, to 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 sanitations and, and and so on. So um, the challenges that I faced in executing these stories, um, especially the grape one, is that uh, most of these employees they were actually um, there were some of them they were reluctant to speak on on on, on their plight. Uh, one, uh, they are claiming that. Um, um, they could not actually uh, say much uh, to, to journalists because um, in previous years they have tried to, to raise their concerns uh, through radios or, or means of, 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 of media, but um, they, some of their employees, they were fired by doing so, so they didn't want to talk. But eventually um, they were calm and they, 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 they were able actually to, to, to speak to me and, and, and openly, um, you know, talk about what they were going through. Um, the other, um, in terms of uh, impact, um, the first story on the dying for the drop of the sound community, um, the government was able to actually uh, 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 fix the borehole um, where, where they were accessing water. They were also provided with um, uh, uh, taps around the community, which is the village that consists of about uh, over 30 uh, homestead, traditional homestead. And with the grape water, um, with the grape water story, um, the communities were, were, were later provided with uh, water dispensers. But uh, what was not actually provided until today is the housing and other amenities such as uh, access to toilets. So they are still actually, uh, you know, uh, go to the bushes and, and nearby uh, mountains to, you know, to to pee and, and so on. So um, I just want to speak on uh, the power of collaborations. Um, 
collaborating or actually being part of the CCIJ is, is one thing that um, I know I could not have executed well if it wasn't for the funding that I have received from the CCIJ. And also these stories, um, I should say that I should speak on, on the fact that uh, the team of the CCIJ that also uh, comprises of some editors and fact checkers, they were a I was able to, 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 to be assisted in, in the fact that they wrote into to assist on the data collections, um, you know, assembling the story together, um, and, and so on. And um, you know, one of these uh, the, the 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 big story was actually um, uh, recognized um, um, in Namibia in that um, um, the editors forum um, uh, 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 journalism awards, um, uh, you know, uh, put it out there. Um, uh, the story won the, the Best Environment in Agriculture Awards this year in April, and um, it also uh, 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 well, it was also able to make me the um, the journalist of the year in Namibia um, uh, this year. Um, so I think um, if there is anyone that has questions, uh, we can speak on that further. But uh, I have so much information here that um, if there's anyone that wants to know something that um, that, that I can speak on, I, I, I'm still here so we can talk further and just have a conversation. Yeah. Thank, no, thank you very much, Sonia, and congratulations on the recognition. Your work is so uh, deservedly earned and talking both about um, the collaboration, again, through the financial support, but also in this one, we worked a little more directly on sort of the editorial component. Uh, Ray Joseph and Yaffa Frederick. Uh, we, we talked about some of the visual elements as well. So um, thank you so much for that example. And so what I'd like to do now is to uh, hear from Jason, because uh, he'll round out the people who have kind of worked on our side, and then bring in Evelyn, uh, who with Zam Magazine has worked with people all over the continent for for years, really, and then to Carolyn to kind of give some context around her research and what she's hearing and some of the characteristics, and then we'll sort of shift a little bit uh, going forward. So uh, over, to, over to Jason, and we would ask, uh, Sonia, can you please uh, turn on your, there we are, yeah, very good. Okay, we wanna see, <laughs> we wanna see everybody. So, I so thank see you everyone. so much, Sonia, for turning on the camera. And, and Jason, uh, there were a couple levels of collaboration, both with Lamin as mm -hmm. uh, as the journalist, and then also with the CCIJ team, particularly the data kind of shifted, the data analysis shifted a little bit the story where you went. So please, uh, Jason, over to you. Thank you so much. Hi, um, yeah, this is Jason in, uh, in Banjul. Um, yeah, the collaboration was uh, kind of on, on multiple levels. So obviously, firstly, with um, Lamin Jahate, who's our, um, my Gambian counterpart, who did the reporting on the story. Um, and as Jeff was saying, that the, uh, the real push on this piece was from the, from the data analysis, which was done by um, Hassel Sfalas and uh, Yushi Wang, who did an incredible job to push what was kind of a localized story into uh, into a national story around water contamination here in the Gambia um, and Yushi obviously brought her expertise in, in bringing the visuals to a story that had been reported somewhat locally um, in some of the in some of the local press who had was given a, a, a real new lease of life through the collaboration with CCIJ um, and having the resources of uh, the expertise of, uh, of Hassel, Fallas and Yushi Wang to, to bring the data. Um, so the, the story basically was looking at um, contamination at a local level in the village of Gunjur. Um, there was high levels of, of iron in the water, but it was seen as just kind of a local problem. But thanks to the data investigation, it showed it wasn't just in Gunja, but it was countrywide. The data also uh, revealed the um, the contamination by E. coli, which we hadn't initially looked at. So that turned out that um, data that had been drawn from uh, Pura, which is a, a local regulatory body, was, was very, very different from the data that um, the analysis found 
that had been drawn up from uh, from UNICEF, and it was showing about 45 percent or so of the population were actually drinking contaminated water. So we were able to to focus not just on the uh, on the iron contamination, but on the actually much more dangerous E. coli contamination that was happening in the communities. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, Jason's work was was also featured in addition to. Uh, being featured within the Gambia on CCIJ's website, uh, it ran in the metaverse uh, space, which we which we launched uh, in August. So we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. So thank you so much, Jason. So I, I I wanted to spend a little bit of time hearing from from different parts throughout the continent, people working in different ways, people in different disciplines, and so on. And so. Evelyn, uh, you know, you, you've done this kind of work for a really long time uh, with Zam Magazine and uh, did that tremendous project earlier this year. So thoughts uh, from you, Evelyn, about, you know, collaboration and obviously coming uh, Zam Magazine based outside the continent. You're, you're grounded in, in Johannesburg. But can you talk a little bit about some of the work that you've done and some of the dynamics that you see uh, that, yeah. that some of the other panelists have already touched on? Yeah. In our case, it actually started with the network um, because um, there used to be a forum for African investigative reporters. Later, this has now morphed into the African Investigative Publishing Collective that sort of encompasses like 40 African journalists, 40 plus in 22, 24 countries on the African continent. Uh, I was a part of that as an investigative journalist based in Johannesburg. Um, that has sort of morphed into the ZAM network because my other cap is that I'm the investigations editor for ZAM, which is based in the Netherlands. And we have found, and I'm sure you also find that, that it is sometimes the way of the detour uh, helps to organize support, uh, helps to be a spider in the web, even though the spider is sort of outside the web. Um, but but you, 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 you provide this editorial support to a, a whole lot of people who, who are battling without support, often in very difficult circumstances. Sonia have, has alluded to that. Um, then it all started not because we wanted to do it, but because from the network, you kept hearing the stories that actually always had to do with dysfunction, chaos, lack of public service, contaminated water, no drinking water, uh, kleptocrats in power. So we sort of, in the end, we find ourselves like at the opposite end of, of the network that does things like the Pandora Papers. Like I, I like it. Yeah, without saying that we are on the same level because these guys are fantastic. Um, but we sort of complement that because we have come to focus in on how come that money gets collected from the African countries and the African public in the first place. Uh, how do they get those hundred million pounds that they then transfer to the Bahamas or, or the villas in the south of France? How do they get all that? Um, and, and, and that has started with a little transnational investigation here, um, African oligarchs we had, then we uh, had public disservice to show that even when a country has a budget, like the Nigerian health budget itself is, is, a, is a thing to behold. There's so much money in it, but only kleptocrats can get it. Um, so so we, we find these parallels and and, and, and that culminated into the kleptocracy series uh, from 10 countries, which you can find on, uh, on the website zenmagazine.com. And, and you get into, you get really, and that is the strength of any collaboration. It's also what I think Steve has been doing in, in, in South Africa, even though it's in South Africa, but then in the whole continent, um, you get to the structural problems. It's not just one corrupt guy who, uh, or one bad company. Um, there are state structures in place in, in almost every African country. Uh, and academics have been speaking about this post-colonial uh, ruling party state capture in a lot of places in Africa, where public services, there's money for it, but it doesn't happen because the money travels upwards. Uh, it's the opposite of trickle down. Um, 
in Uganda, they still teach your salaries. In, in, in Nigeria, they have uh, the people at the top of the interior ministry make public private partnerships where they have transferred entire budgets to business associates elsewhere. And, and, and the Nigerian public is made to pay. So we're trying to map all those structural tendencies. And what we also find is an advantage of transnational collaboration in that way is that it becomes more easy to publish uh, impact is another thing. We'll talk about that later, because if you're going to have impact on the entire continent, um, you know, with a view to, to, to really uh, bringing down kleptocracy, well, that's, that's some impact. I don't think we're there yet. Um, but at least you, you get to publish internationally because uh, there's a big global public out there that is maybe not so interested in hearing in one corruption scandal in Cameroon because you know the stereotypical response will be yeah well corruption in cameroon huh? so what but if if you show that there is structural that it's not africans who are corrupt but there is systemic faults at the root of 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 money being siphoned upwards instead of downwards and that there's a whole lot of good civil servants. We work a lot with people in the state structures, like people who want to make the buses run on time and give people clean water. And they're often frustrated by the system and sometimes they get victimized and even killed sometimes. So, so you, you want to show that there is a struggle going on in Africa. There's not an Africa is corrupt problem. There is a, a state structures managed uh, in a corrupt way problem that victimizes the public and victimizes the people of goodwill within that system. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. I, I won't mention all the, all the examples. I mean, water is such a great example. You have Namibia, the Gambia, South Africa, all in different ways where governments are simply unable or uncaring uh, with regard to, to making people sick or, or not even sending water tanks and they in South Africa also they can't maintain water pipes we had a minister a provincial minister on tv here in South Africa not long ago who called the press he was opening a tap in a community and and the South African press was yeah that they just couldn't believe it I mean there's one tap and you make a press conference out of that and so many people don't have access to water and councillors, again, a corrupt system. There's councillors who want to sell water. Uh, and that's why they don't want water to be provided for free by their own municipalities. So you have incidents of, of councillors actually sabotaging water systems. So all these things we want to get further into and further into. Uh, and, and we love this opportunity to be with the CCIJ. And it's, it's so great that we made this contact because really this, this, this uh, support for, for journalists who are often battling alone and often also being threatened and victimized when they want to expose and analyze and investigate, especially um, asking for comment. Oh my God, talking about challenges. You don't get comment really, do you? You get a little, you get impact on Facebook and you get people making some promises, but the real, the real culprits right up there, they will often just not answer the phone. They feel untouchable. Um, that's also a reason why we, there should be much, much more collaboration. I'll leave it at that for now. Okay, one, well, wonderful. Thank you so much, Evelyn. And really important point about uh, kind of starting with the network and then going into an organizational structure, but then also making the point about uh, some of these issues that exist across countries and and kind of the deeper structural issues. Um, Carolyn, can we, uh, given that, and, and, and uh, Evelyn, you alluded in your comments to academics studying uh, these issues. So Carolyn, can you, can you talk a little bit about your work and what you're seeing around uh, collaboration around the continent? And, and even in our planning session, you were, you were strong about saying, you know, let, let's talk about some of the specific issues around doing collaborative work on the African continent. So uh, Carolyn, over to you, and then we'll, we'll kind of have a little more uh, free flowing conversation. Really appreciate the initial contributions. I just wanted to mention also that I did share the tip sheet that Evelyn really led us on and that other people contributed to that's in the chat so that there's the, some of the examples that she mentioned, those are available there. But yes, Carolyn, over to you, please. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity.
So uh, what my research, um, how, how I started, it was an inspiration uh, from seeing the way that uh, the Gupta leaks uh, investigation was done uh, in 2017, which was a collaboration of uh, Daily Maverick, Amapungane, and News24. But as I, as I uh, started to read around the topic and see what other investigations uh, were, were, were being carried out out collaboratively and also looking outside of, of, of Africa. A, a lot of uh, important and interesting issues uh, began to emerge. And I want to talk about uh, those issues, some of which my colleagues are already have, have brought about. Uh, the fact that uh, collaborations are diverse, uh, some of them are, are small. Uh, you could have like three, three, three journalists, three investigative journalists working on a story uh, from different um, media organizations nationally. I've also uh, got to find out that there are some collaborations which bring in um, uh, startups, uh, digital startups, and these are collaborating with more experienced investigative journalists. And that is important because there's a lot of skills transfer and resource sharing that take place that takes place uh, when 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 they are work working together. But also uh, something interesting, also speaking as someone who is in the academia, I, I, I've come across some collaborations happening elsewhere. Uh, like in Australia, where investigative journalists, traditional media organizations are collaborating with academic institutions and bringing students on board. And I find that very important in that apart from skills transfer that I've already spoken about, it helps to reduce the gap because in some of the conversations that I've had with journalists and academics, there seems to be a friction or tension between the, the, the organizations themselves, which is industry and the academy, where the industry talks about lack of preparedness and on the other side, you find that within the academic institutions themselves, curricula is not uh, including investigative journalism training, or if it is there, it is steps backwards in terms of what is happening at the moment when it comes to tools, uh, techniques, and what we are talking about uh, collaboration. So I think collaboration also, I think in Africa, as we are talking about all these uh, projects that are happening, we can also think about how we can rope in our students to ensure that our uh, uh, a skills transfer and also maybe appealing to, to academic institutions as well to bring on board investigative journalists who can inform curricula because I think that's where the challenge is because as we are talking about these problems uh, of uh, access to water, of uh, sewage problems, of uh, corruption, unemployment, women who are unable to feed their families as Vanessa was, was talking about her project and all these other projects that have been done uh, 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 by CCIJ and, and others. This seems to be a need to, 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 to cultivate and to impart skills to the future generation of investigative journalists. So hence my emphasis on, on this, which is emerging, that there's little cooperation between academic institutions and industry itself, yet they could actually um, enrich one another and help uh, uh, in nurturing uh, future journalists. Other investigations that I've had to look at, uh, which are happening at the uh, uh, a higher level, global level, uh, I think it, we, we've been privileged at the conference to hear about how the Pandora Papers uh, came about, because also that is showing uh, the issue of, for example, leak-driven uh, uh, investigations, which uh, require collaboration so that skills, because what also I am discovering is that it's not only investigative journalists who are partnering, but there are other professions coming outside of the newsroom who are being brought on board, like 
people who have got skills in uh, in in in, in uh, illicit finance, for example, uh, legal experts are being br uh, brought on board. Uh, accountants are coming on board, and I've spoken to journalists who have been embarking uh, on these investigations uh, in Zimbabwe, in South Africa and in West Africa and so on. And, and, and something also that is uh, important, um, which I want to do, I think as we are speaking within the African context, collaborations such as West African Leagues, it's a West African collaboration, Luanda Leaks is West African, but it's it was they were driven by ICIJ, which is internationally, which is a, a network of, of journalists at that level. So again, in talking to journalists, they were, uh, I've heard some journalists within the African context talking about how that can be unsustainable. They want homegrown uh, or pan-African networks is what Evelyn was talking about, that there has been this network of journalists. So such networks that can be able to, to drive uh, these investigations, though of course that has got its own challenges uh, because journalists talk about the fact that there are problems as they are doing these investigations. Uh, for example, the fact that they are being tracked. So issues of surveillance come into, into play and issues around security, very important, particularly in this uh, digital context. There's issues, uh, I've spoken to journalists uh, in Zimbabwe who talk about how difficult the, the conditions are to carry out investigative journalism because of uh, a censorship, because of lack of funding, because of uh, a lack of dedicated investigative journalism desks. And there's something, while we may talk about collaboration and, and the beauty of it and the advantages, uh, we should also remember that journalism is known to be a competitive profession. And some journalists have shared with me how that element of competition continues to be there. They continue to, to compete amongst themselves within the newsroom and even with outside uh, uh, organizations uh, as, as they are competing for, for, for audiences and, and so on. So those are some of the, I, I, I'm sure we'll talk about uh, the, the problems within the context, uh, the African context later, but these are some of the issues I think that threaten uh, 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 collaboration uh, if we are thinking of uh, how we can make it uh, more sustainable. But I, I don't want to appear like I'm painting in a negative uh, a picture because for, from what has been presented by my colleagues and what I've also uncovered in the research is the fact that collaborations are winning uh, 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 um, uh, awards and they are driving change. And this is what is important because this is what uh, the role of investigative or journalism is to, to bring about change, to, to influence decisions, to, to, to put into the uh, forum uh, issues that are affecting uh, people at different levels. And what I like about the work, for example, that is being done by ICCIJ, it, it, uh, there's a, a focus on, on uh, issues affecting people at the grassroots and that kind of solutions uh, or constructive uh, investigative journalism is what is important. And it helps journalists to, 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 to think more critically about the kinds of issues uh, to focus on. Because investigative journalism is not just about the political elite, but it's about the people at the bottom. It's about uh, these people. Evelyn has spoken about uh, civil servants who want to do good work, yet within the system, they are crippled by some corrupt practices and so on, or a culture of, of, of not wanting to, to do a good work and so on. So, so there's a lot of issues, I think, uh, that are emerging uh, in the research. And uh, I think we, we have a good platform here to, to discuss how we can move uh, forward and how we can capitalize on such platforms and networks like CCIJ and others that uh, exist also on the continent. There are so many African hubs for investigative journalism that promote training, that promote uh, a sharing of ideas, that encourage people to work on common issues. I think for, for, for now, I can end it there. 
Okay. Thank, no, thank you very much, uh, Carolyn, for a really wide ranging kind of synthesizing type of comment, pointing out that there are different sizes of collaboration. And we, we've learned at CCIJ, we often try and start small and then build. So for example, with Steve, when Steve and his team did Rivers of Sewage, we had already worked together on a couple other stories that he had, he had done with Ray Joseph, an important point about the role of academia, some of the issues around operating within the African context specifically, and, and the idea of Pan-African networks, and then really bringing us to talking about challenges and, and the role of, of solutions and kind of who is doing that. And I will certainly be transparent and say that I feel that at CCIJ, we've had a learning curve. We're a new organization. Everybody on our team is, is working on a part-time basis. Um, you know, we're sort of still finding our ground. And precisely to your point, Carolyn, about you know, how much interaction do we have? What's reasonable to expect for the money that uh, we're able to provide and so on. And I feel that we learned uh, some lessons uh, through the experience of collaborating with Steve and, and, and your group, Steve, as that we tried to apply as, as, the, as, the year, uh, as the year has gone on. So maybe we can shift, given that, to thinking about what are some of the challenges that people find in collaboration. We absolutely, I think everybody sees the benefit and value of it, but I think it's very important to talk about the challenges. And then from there, uh, uh, the solutions um, that, that, um, that people have come up with, both solutions in terms of the issues that are addressed, but also solutions in terms of how to collaborate more effectively. Why don't we shift in that direction? And before we do, I just wanted to mention that I see Andiswa uh, is here, uh, Matikinsa from uh, Oxpeckers, and uh, Oxpeckers has done tremendous uh, investigative work, and uh, Andiswa has spoken about that work um, for, for and with uh, CCIJ, so we're very glad that you're, you're on this way. Uh, Sonia, did I see that you had your hand up at one point? Did you wanna uh, get in on this, thinking about some of the challenges and solutions? Uh, did you wanna say something, Sonia, on that? And then maybe Steve, you know, you could talk about from your side and then we can see where others are, but did you wanna say something, Sonia? Okay, maybe maybe not for the moment, but we'll we'll come back. Uh, so, Steve, could you talk about from your you know your your kind of team's perspective and experience so, some of the things that are, were, were, have been challenging about collaborations, and then how you've gotten through them, lessons learned, uh, and so on. So, might you be able to speak to that, Steve? And then hopefully we can get Sonia in after you. Uh, sure, thanks, Jeff. Um, <clears throat> before I, I do that, I just um, what Caroline mentioned about academia is interesting. Um, I'm, I'm presuming you're referring to um, journalism institutions or institutions in which, yeah. So, yeah, there, there's, I'm, I'm, I'm finding a lot of collaboration, not with uh, uh, journalism academics, but with uh, uh, academics in scientific departments when it comes to working with water, which is, has been fantastic. Um, professors of, of departments who are willing to, to share what students are working on and, and, and um, explain various uh, theses that, that, that have been published uh, in, in, in this, you know, regarding water pollution, which has been of great assistance in, in terms of this particular subject matter. Um, I, th I think there's, there's an avenue to explore there. I don't think there's enough work, but. Uh, uh, um, journalists working up with with academics and uh, uh, you know in, in particularly in scientific fields and also in, in the arts and social fields as well there's there's rich resources there and 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 those links are, are, are important um regarding the challenges of, of, of rivers of sewage um you know there's the I mean there's there's the normal working in the field challenges that that journalists experience and and um, each person working in their own country will will have those and and, and know them. And, and, and have ways to, to get around them. As, as Evelyn mentioned, sometimes it's, it's the inability to get official comment. Um, and well, you know, you just, <laughs> you, there's, there's ways to do that by, by looking at various reports, by going closely uh, uh, through municipal agendas at the, the council meetings and um, picking out what's been said in, in those meetings. Um, which should be, although not always publicly available. The, the, the bigger metros, they, they normally are publicly available on websites. Um, 
and in the smaller uh, smaller um, municipalities, uh, it, it may involve actually attending those those meetings regularly, which journalists should really be doing as much as they can anyway. Um, there's there is a challenge between uh, north south relations. Um, the the main challenge we had, and I mean this has been resolved, so there's there's no <laughs> there's no criticism or, or, or anything. It's 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 merely, as I say, lessons learned. Is um, it's it related to the video production that we did. I mean, uh, CCIJ were wonderful in terms of of editorial guidance of suggesting uh, uh, slightly different ways of of writing the story of of um, or, or setting it out. But video production was something relatively new to us. Uh, uh, um, Peter Lohanga, who did the video, he, he's, 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 he's experienced, he's done video courses, but he doesn't do video as a matter of course. Um, he runs his own uh, community newspaper publication, and um, he's, he's, he's normally uh, print-based or text-based, but certainly he knows his way around video and, 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 and basic editing. So the video he did, uh, which I thought initially was 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 very good i thought well this is this is this is a very good video um it covers all the bases it's a little bit of post editing work is done but uh, then then the feedback was a lot of like uh going back uh, to 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 reshoot scenes in different lights and so on and so forth and I thought, well, hang on, going back and doing all this work, it's kind of beyond the scope of the money available from the grant. Um, it's maybe a, what we're looking at is a bit high end, like, yes, a bit of reshooting, a bit of e editing. And, and then my mistake, what I did was I then went silent. I was like, no, we can't really do this. You know, we, we can't, we can't produce a Hollywood feature yet. We don't have the budget for it. <laughs> and it's it's you know it's it's just it's just not within the means and 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 it's uh, the video is uh, only one aspect of of the collaboration in, in uh, so my mistake was was then not to go silent uh, well was was essentially to go silent and, and just to carry on doing the work um which of course was not helpful and and then i had to deal with that later and and, and kind of go well you know um yeah but this, I think it speaks to a bigger issue in North-South relations in that I think as, as Africans, we have a bit of an imposter syndrome. <laughs> we, we don't always necessarily believe enough in ourselves. And I, I think this is also because of, um, you know, we're inundated with Western media. We're inundated with the New York Times or, or, or The Guardian. We, we're, not, we're not inundated with uh, the, the Lagos Chronicle, you know, um, or the Nairobi Times. So... We, we we maybe need to have a bit of a greater belief in in in, in ourselves and and our, our abilities and 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 I to 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 sort of stand up and and, and have a, a little bit of, of of pushback if you like not 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 in a not in a way that's um uh, 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 not in terms of conflict but just to kind of uh, stand our ground in in a debate around issues and of course to you know. Um, but but to, to be open to to to, to learning and, and 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 gaining from the vast experience that that European publications and journalists have in in terms of production values, but um, also to 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 maybe you know also be able to just be willing um, to stand up and say well you know this is or this isn't possible or why do you think the production value should be should be this when we working here in africa and local values it's a bit like if you think of the difference between hollywood and nollywood you know hollywood is fantastic production values uh nollywood is much much lower production values but but the nollywood is much more popular in nigeria so who is our audience here um are we wanting to speak to other people in Africa or are we wanting to speak to people in New York or, 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 or Washington? Um, so that's, that's just sort of one aspect. And as Jeff says, you know, it's, it's, it's a learning curve and, and certainly next time I would speak up immediately. I wouldn't. And I think, I think, I, I think it's happened in some other collaborations as well, where you kind of, 
people go silent rather than than than, than putting their views forward and 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 kind of having that that debate. Um, and I, I think it speaks to a um, uh, a conflict avoidance, if you like, um, which is not always healthy. I don't know if that helps, Jeff. No, it, it helps tremendously. And thank you, Steve, for uh, your candor in, in sharing that. And certainly <clears throat> that particular project prompted a lot of discussion within, on our side about you know, how much time and energy is reasonable to expect. And, and even more, the issue that you're raising underneath it, Steve, how can we work together to build the trust and connections so that if there is some difference of opinion, people don't uh, avoid or not speak, but how can we get to where we, we're able to talk openly about some of these challenges? So I can't tell you how much I appreciate both the work that you and your team did, but also we're really starting to talk about the, the, you know, the, these challenges and how we get there. So no, thank, thank you very much for putting that on the table. Um, Sonia, are, are you able to, uh, to get in? Um, and I know I did want to mention also Fiona McLeod has joined us. Fiona also with Oxpeckers, uh, a, a group that we respect and admire uh, tremendously. But Sonia, are, did you have a thought about this in terms of some of the, the challenges and lessons learned and solutions could be related to what Steve said, but certainly doesn't have to be? Are we able to hear from you, Sonia? Um, hi, Jeff and everyone. Yes. Uh, basically, I'm having um, issues with my camera. Um, every time I'm trying to, to switch on, it says that I need to be the host and it has stopped it or something like that. Um, I did put it up on the on the chat. Um, uh, basically, I in terms of challenges uh, 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 in the context of collaborative work, I have not really experienced um, um, challenges uh, in my personal capacity, but um, I was listening to Caroline when um, she spoke um, extensively about the importance of, uh, of collaborative work and the fact that um, it, it, it's, uh, you know, uh, speaking obviously on, 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 on the work that has been done by the CCIJ that, um, you know, we, uh, that it's 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 not really uh, um, targeting you know the elites or the politicians or the big guys, but also trying to 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 to, to you know drive changes on the on the ordinary citizens of, of of all our countries, either in Africa or abroad and so on. So um, I just wanted to 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 give a context on the in 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 the Namibian um, uh, um, uh, 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 solutions. Um, in Namibia, for a very long time, uh, we have not really had uh, journalism um, that 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 writes on issues that are you know concerns the public, the you know the ordinary person. Um, we have always uh, been writing about you know the politicians, um, you know those that are having power, those you know those that you know um, the mismanagement of public funds, uh, the corruption that is happening there. Um, especially in the pub, in, 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 in the public se sectors and, and parastatals. Uh, but it's it's starting to pick up now. Um, and uh, it also complements on the, the, some of the, the two projects that I mentioned earlier that I worked with the CCIJ because they are, they are, they are, they are human interest kind of stories. Uh, and it, it's only starting to pick up really now. And I, I, I can actually you know, attest to the fact that, you know, these are the kind of work that actually really drive changes. You know, in 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 countries, and um, you know, the other day I was speaking to 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 to, to Vanessa about uh, one of the story that I think I, I gave her a link, and I said I like this story that you did, and I would like to do something in the Namibian context. Of course, she was like, "No, I, I'm able to help." So I'm just um, pointing out that um, you know, this kind of work is 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 really. It, it is driving changes like like Caroline were, were just saying that it, it just needs to be built up. It needs to continue, and uh, it, it's not just about the big guns. Right, Colonel, thank you uh, very much uh, for those thoughts, um, Sonia and and uh, Vanessa. I see uh, you're back in. Did you have some thoughts about? <clears throat> excuse me. Potential. I know you've done a lot of different types of collaboration, but challenges. Some of the solutions that come forward. Uh, Sonia was just talking about how supportive you are, and, and I know I mentioned that earlier. So thought, thoughts from your side, Vanessa, around this issue of challenges and then uh, potential solutions. And I did want to say, 
you know, we, we've been talking for about an hour. Uh, you know, we still have about 50 minutes left, but please, uh, if, if the people who are attending have questions or comments, you know, please feel free to, to jump in. It's, it's, it's a nice intimate group. So we, we don't feel you have to wait to be invited in. Uh, but Vanessa, something, anything you wanted to share on this? So um, some of the challenges are with um, individual newsrooms and um, publishing the stories that come out, you know, from col collaboratives. So while you may have agreed, you know, as a collaborative on a story idea, when it's not quite suited to the in-house, I don't want to say policy, if it's going to rough, um, rustle, ruffle um, feathers, you know, that, that puts the story at risk with um, editors agreeing to publish or disagreeing or chucking out chunks of the story that they're not um, very pleased with. So that's, 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 um, that's a problem, you know, and having to convince them about why it's a good story. It's not everybody who may be able to succeed with that. So that, that's, um, that's a challenge that, I mean, some, some journalists are having to deal with. Um, another thing, I was um, very pleased with what you said, Caroline, about collaborating with um, the academia and industry, because that's something I have greatly advocated for and um, would like to encourage journalists. Areas where you have interest in, it's important that um, you're looking at academic work in those areas, especially with data, because they're on the field, they're churning numbers out, and these are verifiable information that, um, that they're putting out there. And they also are good sources, you know, for to enrich your story. So it's good that you mentioned that because it's something that I have um, been advocating for my, myself. Because I think um, academia and journalism are working towards the same goal, but using different vehicles to achieve that one goal. So this is what I'd like to say. All right. No, th thank you very much. And I just left the room. Oh, here we go. Here it is. I see it. Never mind. Sorry. Okay, yeah, sorry, I just left the room for a minute. That's why I muted the uh, video. But, you know, th thank you very much uh, for that point, Vanessa. And I will share in a minute. Um, it, I also teach at Grand Valley State University in Michigan, and we worked on a project in 2018 and 2019 with three undergraduate students and USA Today's national investigative team around reverse mortgages in the United States. Uh, and it, it had some pretty good impact. There were some challenges associated with that type of collaboration, but I agree that. That's a very fruitful avenue to, to explore. Um, Evelyn, or, or how about for you in terms of some of the issues we're hearing about as far as challenges and solutions and, and how we can move forward? The, the point that Steve was raising about when there's a difference of opinion, do people move in and talk about it or do people withdraw a little bit? And how do we get that sense of, of confidence and, and trust um, to, to be able to have some of those conversations about, you know, actually I don't see this or you don't understand my context or, yeah. you know, I, I, I want to speak up, but I'm a little uncomfortable. Can, can you talk to some of that, please, Evelyn, that your experience from Zen Magazine? Yeah. It ties in with what Sonia said about listening to the people on the ground, the public, um, because in many ways, journalists like Sonia and many of the journalists that we work with and that Steve works with and Steve himself and myself, we're actually ordinary people. Uh, some of us uh, don't have the challenges of deprivation that people in, in, in very deprived areas that we visit um, uh, suffer like Vanessa and her IDP camps and, 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 and us when we go to the places where there's only water with E. coli in it. But when it comes to access to the authorities, um, we are only marginally better off. Um, they talk about this voice of the voiceless. <laughs> it always makes me, uh, it irritates me a bit because everybody has a voice. Uh, nobody is voiceless. Our job is to see if we can collect all those voices and add our own voice and get through to these politicians um, and, and elite guys. And I want to make two remarks about journalism as challenge. 
because the one challenge is a tradition of journalism where an inordinate amount of space in columns and in broadcast time is allocated to politicians speeches and politicians press conferences and politicians photo ops, uh, whereas we should be talking about the public that doesn't have water and whose salaries are being stolen and um, are being threatened, uh, losing their job when they speak out. That is the public that we are for. We could be a channel, but fortunate, unfortunately, we often can't even get that. Um, to, to connect those issues that the public has, um, that ordinary people have to the powers that be. You go to the authorities, you demand comment. When you are outside the situation of deprivation, you can have access to legal help, maybe uh, safety for the journalist who finds himself threatened or the good civil servant who finds him or herself threatened. Um, what we do from Amsterdam sometimes, I'm moving straight into solutions. Um, but it's, it's only a temporary solution. Um, we actually phone governments in Africa from Amsterdam and donors to those governments, asking the, the guy in charge, do you know that this happens? Do you know that you're responsible for it? And sometimes we don't succeed, but sometimes they do pick up the phone when it's a phone call from a Western country. That's sadly what the situation is. And like the World Bank, we had this journalist in Mali, Jeff, you know him, David, David Dembele. Um, he's trying to get the World Bank in Mali to, to answer questions about what happened to the COVID-19 relief money. Can't get there. It's tried 27 times. Can't get any comment. We phone the World Bank. At least you get somebody to speak to you. Not that it's very useful or fruitful, but at least, you know, they, they, they feel compelled to, to say something. Maybe that helps. So, so we really need to, to move from reporting on what politicians say to reporting what the public says and then trying to hold the politicians accountable, especially when they then get rich and transfer money uh, to offshore tax havens and so the other journalistic challenge that I wanted to talk about uh, relates a little bit to what Steve said about uh, is the quality of my video good enough? Uh, I don't know if I summarize it correctly. Um, yeah, qualitatively, I mean, you can never be Hollywood and you can, it's very difficult to become the New York Times or the BBC when it comes to the pure technical aspects of it. But I think oftentimes African journalists tell a better story. They tell a lot of truth. They break through a lot of prejudice. Um, I can tell you when I started uh, doing investigative journalism here in Johannesburg, that's 17 years ago, um, I spoke to a colleague of mine, Musikilo Mojit of Premium Times. Uh, I'm saying that because there's a Premium Times person here. Um, and I said, yeah, but all these stories about corruption in Africa, isn't it a bit racist? Um, everybody always buys into the stereotype of Africa's corrupt. Maybe we should talk about other things. And Mojit said, are you mad? <laughs> Africans are suffering under this nonsense of, of corruption of our states and regimes. And, and we actually have to go in hiding sometimes because we expose too much of it. And then you tell me we mustn't entertain that. So there is an interesting uh, issue that happens with journalists. I see it often in colleagues from Western countries. We don't want to hold African leaders accountable because we have this fear that, no, but then we're going to say something racist about Africans, which is nonsense. These are leaders and they have to be held accountable and the African public wants journalists to hold them accountable. So. That's another thing we need to battle with as, uh, as journalists who want to publish globally, that, that even when it comes to development aid, oh my God, you have to wade through so much prejudice and nonsense from the, from the donor people, especially the, the, the high up ones, that they, they still see Africa, everybody in Africa, uh, leaders, public, exploiters, um, people who are killed and jailed, that's just one amorphous mess and they all need money. So we're going to keep donating to the Ugandan police force. There's so much that we have to wade through as journalists. And I just want to end this by, or my contribution by saying, can we please continue this talk off screen and, and talk a lot more and, and, and see where we can get together with all that.
No, th thank you. Thank you very much, Evelyn. And um, re re really important points that they're that kind of emerging around uh, both the collaborations with the communities you cover and then who are the choices of the focus of the coverage. Um, perhaps hesitancy on, on both sides um, around moving into, on the one hand, uh, from the outside saying, can we hold these leaders accountable? On the, on the other side saying, you know, can I, can I speak up? And, and really this question of, you know, there are existing inequities that we say we want to get rid of, but on the other hand, are we in some ways replicating them in the work we do and how do we move to address that, put that on the table and try to move forward on that? So, uh, Carolyn, in terms of the, the, the point that um, Evelyn's amazing about talking, but also trying to move forward, um, thoughts about you know, things that seem to be working well, either on the content side, on, on the team, collaborative side, on that developing that homegrown cadre. I mean, that's one of the things that we're excited about, you know, trying to work with at, at CCIJ to have more and more local folks. Ray Joseph, when he was the Southern African editor, was very uh, strong on that. Um, so thoughts about that, and maybe we can hear from Jason, because uh, Jason is both uh, work at, li working and living in the Gambia, from, you know, you're from England, so navigating some of those dynamics there. And then, of course, we'll, we'll obviously want to hear from everybody else. But th thoughts about this particular uh, section of the conversation that you helped bring about, Carolyn, but obviously people have had some very rich comments on. Yes. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, it's, it's just a, a, a minor uh, a contribution just to, to, to add on uh, because uh, the issues have already been uh, discussed and, and expanded on. But I think uh, our forums uh, such as uh, we have uh, at CCIJ are actually helping uh, with training because we are seeing a lot of uh, uh, training workshops uh, which can uh, help to empower with skills. So I think that's what we can actually uh, capitalize on and, and build up uh, the training workshops and also bringing on board uh, diverse and more um, uh, players uh, to, to, to contribute in that regard. And uh, if you could allow me to, to talk also uh, uh, briefly about uh, the fact that maybe that there's also need to, to strengthen uh, security systems because that's another uh, threat to, to, to these collaborations where so many people are involved. Uh, that there's a need to, to have strong uh, 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 whether technological tools uh, that do that work or, or just uh, security awareness. And this also ties uh, to the issues around whistleblower protection, especially collab most, as most collaborations we are seeing are, 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 are leak driven or their documents which are being shared from government offices uh, by disgruntled uh, civil servants and so on. There's a need to have these conversations more around uh, coming up with strong whistleblower uh, protection laws. Uh, also ensuring that even investigative journalists, when we are interacting with whistleblowers or our sources, we make them aware of the risks, the potential risks, and also how they can protect themselves. Because from, from uh, I like that uh, uh, the, the AIJC conference has, has helped to bring up these conversations uh, in, in, different, in, in, in different years. Also usage of social media, how do you use social media to interact with sources in a secure manner? I think these are issues that, that, that need to keep uh, coming up, being reinforced, uh, having more training and awareness uh, to, to ensure that as we are doing our work as investigative journalists, we, we don't leave any gaps uh, that make it easy for people that want to suppress or make these stories uh, to, to not go out. And just lastly to say what Evelyn was saying about also rethinking what journalism is because traditional journalism is news values are built around conflict, the political elite and so on. What about the public? Maybe also thinking about a bits that affect publics. Uh, one speaker at the conference spoke about a beef Bid for poverty, for example. Do we have it? We don't have it because we have other bids that encourage us to, to follow uh, 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 politicians at conferences. And, and that becomes problematic if we're saying news is what 
a, a politician says, it's what a government official says. And what we are seeing with PR officers also playing a role in, in political spin. And as journalists, if we're just going to reproduce what public relations officers are, are doing, spinning information and channeling propaganda, it, it, it affects uh, 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 this uh, project that we have to bring about accountability. Well, no, th thank you, uh, Carolyn. Very, very profound point there uh, that you just made at the end, in addition to highlighting the, the critical importance of security um, on, on a number of different levels, physical, digital, electronic, and so on. So, but, but, but maybe through that uh, last part that you're talking about in terms of how are we understanding what journalism is, and certainly I think the, the, the emergence of collaboration has been something pushing uh, some of these changes, even as you said earlier, there is there's still some competitive dynamics there. So why don't we, uh, Jason, hear, hear from you, uh, your thoughts about any of the issues that have been uh, raised, and then start to move toward the, uh, where are we going? What might we want to do next? Um, are there ways that we can distribute the work in, in interesting ways? Are there networks that we can build? And, and also, let's be honest, put, put the idea of money on the table because uh, resources obviously matter in, in, the, in, the, in the capacity to do the work. So, so Jason, over to you. And again, if anybody uh, has, a, has either a comment or a question, we, we really welcome other, others' input as well as we start to head toward the, the last quarter of the session. So Jason, over to you. Okay. Um, I, I, it's a shame Lamin Jahat is not here because of being a Gambian journalist, I think he would, uh, you know, much better to tell it from his point of view. But from my observations, you know, Gambia, it was, hasn't been too long that we came out of a 22-year dictatorship that was absolutely brutal on the press. Um, assassinations, disappearances, um, burning down of, of uh, you know, media houses. So that the Gambia is sort of slowly emerging from that. Um, and so I think the idea of collaboration is absolutely essential for Gambia journalism to, uh, you know, to raise to a, to a much higher standard. It's been working at a fairly low level, unfortunately. Um, there are a few people working on investigative issues, but a lot of people just, you know, they don't have the, um, the capacity um, they don't have the support to tell a lot of the stories that need to be told here. You know, we have rampant corruption over the last four years. Um, obviously, the war issues around water, environment. Um, but a lot of the journalists here just uh, you know, don't have the training. They don't have the, um, like I said, the resources really to tell these stories. So I think collaboration here in Gambia for, for journalism on the, on the print side, as well as from my side, uh, on the visual side, it's, it's absolutely essential to, uh, to move forward. Okay, well, th thank you uh, for that, Jason, and really important point about just kind of where is the local journalism culture and what have the conditions been for journalists in the country, depending on the political uh, configuration. So, no, thank, thank you very much. Uh, why don't we just uh, take a minute and see um, questions, comments, uh, things people wanna share among uh, the attendees on, on what we've spoken about. Um, and then after we hear and kind of address some of that, we can start to shift toward the, you know, where are we going and how do we, how do we see ourselves moving forward? So questions or comments, I see Purity is here. So welcome Purity, very glad you're here. Uh, obviously Judith is here. Um, so so uh, questions or comments from anybody? Okay. Well, please know that the, the, uh, the door is open. Um, and so what I wanted to do now was just go back to um, the, the tip sheet and just kind of touch base. You know, we, we, we've covered quite a few of these topics so far, but maybe we can start move toward the, you know, what is next, innovation in distributing and presenting the work, Pan-African virtual newsroom, and... Um, the, the issue of, of resources or, or funding. So uh, anybody on the panel would like to take on uh, any of these kind of on the, the what's next or um, any of those issues, what, 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 uh, it's open, anybody wanna take that on? Ah, okay, and then we do have a question, we have a question 
or comment from uh, Andiswa. Sorry, just one sec. We'll get Andiswa's question. Uh, how have you avoided coming across as racist or undertones of racism or prejudice when exposing corruption by African leaders? So I don't know, Evelyn, do you, do you, do you want to uh, talk? I know you're raising that earlier, and maybe that can also be a way toward moving forward. So uh, thank Oh, and sorry, the question is, in fact, for Evelyn. So uh, thank, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Andiswa. Yeah. So Evelyn? Uh, I, I know it has happened to colleagues. It happens to colleagues in South Africa a lot. I don't write a lot for South African media. I, I think it happened once or twice. It happens a lot to other white colleagues in, uh, in South Africa. It's kind of a stock response, which is sad because it evaluates the very real uh, existing racism. I mean, there are real racist things happening and you can't be... Uh, a kleptocrat leader, and then when somebody points out that you're sitting on a uh, hundred million pounds of money, accuse people of being racist. Uh, if if they could just stop that, that would be very nice. All right. Well, thank you, Th thank you for that, Evelyn. And and, and thoughts about uh, moving forward. I know you you put in the in the um, tip sheet this idea, and you brought that up earlier, kind of a pan African uh, virtual newsroom. Uh, but thoughts thoughts about moving forward, maybe start with you, Evelyn, and then anybody else, of course, who wants to get in. Okay, um, yeah, let me just uh, say that the idea of a Pan-African virtual newsroom came up because uh, lots of journalists battle so, um, even when we've been doing these transnational investigations for a couple of years now, and sometimes we work with, with people who have their own newsrooms, who have sort of their independent funding, even though it's never enough. But sometimes you work with freelancers who, who really, really battle. I mean, they, they spend all their money just to go to an internet cafe to talk to you. Then they hear that their mother in the village has malaria. Then they're forced to ask you for some money because otherwise they can't even start the project. And those, those things happen all the time. And then you need to get money when there is a legal challenge. Uh, our Nigerian uh, journalist was very, very careful uh, in pointing out that the interior ministry had channeled state budgets to business associates. Still, he gets taken on by somebody who has a hell of a lot of money and a lot of lawyers. So you are forced to some, somehow find $2,000 uh, to help with that. And, uh, then there is a safety issue. Somebody has to go into hiding. We are small. Like Jeff said, we, I think we're similar. We all work part-time and we're just three or four people. Uh, we can't take all that on. And then there is the editorial support, the languages. I mean, I, I have never written a story that was published unedited. You, 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 you always need somebody else to look at your story. Um, especially when there are language issues uh, Nigerian English are different from the English that you're trying to sell to a UK based newspaper um, and vice versa. So if we would have like a collaboration that would end up having into a sort of a virtual newsroom where we would have editors, where we would have admin people who could channel all kinds of emergencies to the right people, whether it's legal funds that are out there somewhere, whether it's the CPJ for physical protection, uh, where you could have translators, you could have a pool of experts. Carolyn, thank you, experts. We really need experts. Um, and, 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 and somebody who channels the conversation because somebody in the DRC is experiencing the very same thing that somebody in, this, in Zambia has experienced. If we would just have a newsroom uh, for all of that, because uh, as people have pointed out on the African continent, the number of newsrooms that are able to sustain investigative journalism who have the resources and the editorial strength capacity to, to do this, they are very few and far between. And there is not one that, that supports you know, several countries in Africa, maybe Sinozo in West Africa, but we need it, uh, I think, in a pan-African setup. So, so Jeff, if you could just make that for us, please, that would be nice. <laughs> well, uh, th th thank you. <laughs> I'll, I'll put that on my to-do list. <laughs> so, so th th thank you. And, and I, I, uh, maybe we can, while we're talking about some of the resource issues, 
Um, Vanessa, if, if you don't mind, uh, since I, Vanessa and I have known each other several years, uh, you, you were at Daily Trust and uh, working to get these very powerful stories out with some challenges there, working as, as a freelancer, uh, and then trying to generate resources to do the work that you're very passionate about. And now at CNN, so you've had a number of different vantage points, media houses, um, thoughts about you know, resources to do, to do this kind of work, this, this collaborative work, and um, you know, kind of how you see us moving forward in that area, just from your experience and perspective. So um, the challenges regarding resources are very real. And um, I would like to say that beyond looking at journalism organizations for funding, we should begin also to look at um, professional organizations because a lot of them are given funding and even um, non-governmental organizations like Ford Foundation, MacArthur Foundation, um, you um, sometimes, UN, is it UN Women or UNICEF? Maybe not full funding or partial funding, you know, to, to get resources to do your stories. That's what I was doing as um, a freelancer. So I was looking up NGOs, looking at their thematic areas. And for those of them who were collaborating with journalists, I was pitching ideas to and, you know, getting funding for my work. Also with them, um, I belong to a community of practice for health policy and systems researchers. They also have funding to do work with journalists. And when they, when, when you um, collaborate with them, they bring you in to also, um, what, to also teach you the ropes of reviewing and um, research materials and what to look out for from the eyes of a researcher. So if, if you have, I'm, I'm currently, I, I was doing, well, I finished it already. I did that, you know, and that um, broadened my horizon to also understand how they pick subjects to look for funding, to fund those, those areas that they want to research from. So what I'm saying in essence, our network shouldn't be limited only to our journalism um, community. We should look at all these other professional organizations for funding. That that that's what um, that's how I have been able to do it since Living Daily Trust before I joined them, um, CNN, which now funds all my stories. Yeah, no, th thank you, Vanessa. And that's one of the many things I admire about uh, you and your work, your resourcefulness in in identifying a series of different ways to to generate those resources. Uh, Steve, thoughts for you about you know running a, a community newspaper and some of the challenges about getting the paper out on a weekly basis, but then doing these kind of more occasionally more extensive and collaborative projects. And I know we were talking about resources in terms of the, the video issue as far as, well, how much resources are coming in and then what, what time and energy can people dedicate to it? So your thoughts and resources, Steve? Uh, sh sure, Jeff. Uh, I can maybe also just quickly respond to um, Andiso's question about how do you avoid accusations no, please, of please, racism. Please, please. Um, <clears throat> which would normally be leveled more to, at a white journalist in South Africa than a, a person of color. And <clears throat> I think the answer there is, is to stick to the voice of the people. You know, if, if, if you're interviewing a, a wide diversity of people who are, you know, saying that this municipality or, or, or this government department or, or so on is failing us, um, rather than you as the, the, the journalist saying that, then I think it's, it's very hard for, for any officials or uh, anyone with an agenda to then, to then level those accusations. Or if they do, a, a reader could see that they're, they're really just a, a knee-jerk uh, defensive reaction rather than, than having any truth. Um, you know, regarding resources, the, the, uh, I'm glad freelancers have been mentioned because it it's very often goes unmentioned in, in, in um, forums such as these in, 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 in um, yeah. Uh, because freelancers are, are, they really are quite abused. I mean, I've worked as a freelancer essentially all my life about the community paper I run is, is as well as my community paper. It's not owned by any media house. Um, and it's a monthly publication, Jeff. So um, we, we, uh, a weekly, if it was weekly, it, it would be full time. I wouldn't be able to do anything else. So <laughs> as, as a monthly, thank you. Uh, correction. I, thank you. I, I, I keep it relatively small. So um, really, it's it's kind of the last ten days to the week of the month that I have to put aside, uh, or I have to plan around. If I'm doing any other work, I have to put the that's sort of the last ten days of the month aside because that's that's the time I'm going to have to to largely be focusing on 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 bringing the paper out. But that leaves me three other weeks in the month um, 
to focus on other work. Um, but but freelancers are, are a resource for for legacy media and, and big media uh, corporations. You know, they, they, they can always rely on some freelance copy to, to fill a space or, or, you know, but at the same time, they they get very short thrift in terms of, of, of rates that are paid. And of course, uh, freelancers are working with uh, no support whatsoever. And, and that can have um, can have a wide variety of impacts from very basic level of the fact that the camera you're carrying with you is not insured because as a freelancer you don't have the money to pay for insurance and it's your personal camera it's not it's not some media corp uh, corporation's camera so this may make you think two or three times about entering certain areas where we're having such a camera may make you a target first of all um, and then if you are a target who's going to pay for your medical bills if you're stabbed in a mugging or you know Who's going to pay for the replacing the windscreen of your car if it's stoned in a protest that you're covering? Uh, you know that that falls on you as a freelancer at the end of the day, and um, and again, if there's some small error in your copy, um, and there needs to be an apology, or even often this has happened where errors are introduced in the subbing by the media house you're selling to, um, that is then rolled down the hill back on the freelancer. The the, the media house, the editor at the media house, never says mia culpa. It's no, that freelancer was uh, in the wrong, you know, which is not always the case. So um, I think there needs to be, we, when, so when it comes to resources and support, it's, it's not always necessarily about money. Um, I mean, yes, of course, we need to be paid for the work and we need, we need the money to be able to go out and, and, and get the work done. But there are, there are other things like um, perhaps short, some sort of form of short-term insurance being brought on board for equipment that's going out into the field. Or um, medical insurance, possibly, um, you know, I think, um, particularly working in other areas of, of Africa, this, this, this might be very important. Um, and when it comes to security, uh, perhaps uh, discounted rates on um, a, a really good uh, uh, um, cyber security uh, or even just antivirus security, um, on, 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 on the private computers that, that freelancers are often using, you know, those, those sort of resources, I think would be, would be very um, helpful in, in, in terms of being able to, to carry out this work. Um, yeah. Well, no, th thank you, Steve. Really, really important points about different levels of resources about occasionally uh, media houses introducing error and then trying to hold a hold of the freelancer responsible um, about the, the costs that freelancers bear. Um, and I also wanted to mention, uh, I, I'm sure everybody can see it in the chat, but uh, Evelyn and Purity going back and forth a little bit about the virtual newsroom and, and Purity obviously with Finance Uncovered, which does really outstanding work in, in working with and supporting uh, uh, a lot of African journalists doing the, the kind of deep corporate uh, financial and, and kind of forensic accounting analysis, which has just had tremendous impact and working across a lot of countries. So thank, thank you for that. Um, but, but no, really important. And uh, Jason, and then maybe over to Sonia, then, then we'll get Carolyn to start uh, wrapping up. But Jason, I know we, um, we work together on launching the Metaverse site. And so one of the things that we're um, working on is, is trying to uh, create a space in the Metaverse, not just to have a different avenue of distribution, but also to, to mint uh, the images and, and the work that, that journalists do and use that as a mechanism to uh, create revenue in a different way, in addition to the many exciting uh, methods that you mentioned, uh, Vanessa. So Jason, can you talk a little bit about that um, and, and, and your thoughts and kind of reflections on that in terms of you're trying to innovate and create something different? Sure. Um... You know, I, I come from a, a print background um, and so obviously moving from newspapers to magazines to online gave us you know, a great opportunity to create um, much larger photo stories, incorporate uh, video, audio, etc. Um, but stepping into the metaverse is uh, it's definitely new ground for me and obviously something I would not have even particularly thought about by myself. But obviously, working as a collaboration with uh, CCIJ, um, it's an incredible opportunity to take the work to a new level, and and bring it to a, a 
you know, a kind of a younger audience that's, you know, much more au fait with sort of the video games, virtual world type experiences. Um, so I'm hoping through that we'll be able to engage a much, uh, you know, kind of wider audience. Um, and the fact that it's not just, you know, kind of a, a scrolling experience, so the fact you are kind of deep diving into the story, I think is, is really, really powerful. So I think we almost need to, to see it. It's hard to explain the virtual world that, uh, that's been created, but I think it's, it's a, an amazing way to go forward. And I'm really hoping to, you know, to be able to offer more of my visual material to, uh, you know, to create these virtual worlds that people can, uh, you know, can, can walk through, take their time. It's like, you know, being in a, in a gallery, but from the comfort of your own living room. Well, th th thank you, Jason. And um, there we have a flash video, um, just about five minutes, which explains our metaverse space that's available to um, people who attend the conference on YouTube. Um, so uh, I just shared that there's a number of other videos of exciting work that other people at the conference are doing. But, but rather than show that for five minutes, I just wanted to put the link in the chat for people who do want to want to kind of visualize that. So uh, thank you, Jason, for that. Mm -hmm. uh, Sonia, any, 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 uh, any thoughts from you? And of course, anybody else in the group who wants to share, but Sonia, thoughts from you in terms of moving forward and what we need to think about in, in terms of collaboration, Steve really signaling the issue of, of freelancers among others. Um, any thoughts, any, any thoughts from you, Sonia? Um, thank, hi, James, uh, Jeff. Um, I think uh, my final words um, in terms of collaborative work is that um, um, we should also be open to doing work. I think even if there's perhaps no funding, um, um, I think um, um, over the few uh, a few weeks, I've, I've tried to reach out to Jeff even in my own uh, capacity to say that there are certain things that I, I want to execute, especially um, uh, stories, but I need the, 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 the what? Um, I need the help of, of the CCIJ um, or, or the consortium um, at large just to assist in, in assembling the story. Um, sometimes we, we, we have ideas, especially when you're a freelance journalist, you're working on your own and you see potential in, 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 in a story, but then you, you just need help in terms of assembling it. Um, you know, uh, working as a team because obviously the, the consortium is, is, is full of other journalists that 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 are also really um, uh, having skills in, in in data, in in you know in editing, like um, you know um, how um, uh, Evelyn was was speaking about. Sometimes the way you know we write stories in Namibia is is not how you know it should be out there on the international or cross border. Uh, uh, collaborative um, uh, work. So I think we should also look at, um, you know, opportunities to to just do work um, eh, eh, as long as they drive change and, and they bring changes. Uh, we can also, you know, overlook uh, the, the, the issues of, of funding. Sometimes there's no funding um, that is available and you really want to do a story. So I, I think I'm also open to that. Um, so I just wanted to put it up to say maybe, maybe, maybe it's something that all of us can also consider when, you know, there's no funding that is available and we want to do the work. Well, well th thank you uh, for that, Sonia. And obviously uh, that raises a whole host of, of questions and issues um, to address. Um, and I, I did want to mention also that uh, Sonia has been a leader in our community in terms of reaching out in a number of different ways. Uh, uh, earlier this year around uh, press freedom issues in Namibia, where a colleague had an agreement to uh, do an interview with, with the president of Namibia and then got some you know, very serious pushback. And so Sonia reached out to CCIJ. We wrote a letter of, of support in that capacity, but also reaching out more recently. And I'm, I'm thrilled, as, as I mentioned earlier, that Lydia Namubiro is, has joined us as our Africa editor. And Lydia said, oh, no, I'd be happy to work with Sonia and then the, our designers said, oh, no, I'm happy to help with assembling. So there are different ways of working together. It isn't always like a multi-month long-term collaboration that we, we want to be available in those ways as well. Um, and then also, uh, I know I mentioned this earlier, but we, we have collaborated with people on, um, you know, finding, finding work. Um, 
you know, finding um, fellowships, finding jobs, finding, finding funding of their own. And so that's another area where we see some possibilities. Um, Carolyn, things that you're seeing in your research, promising practices, innovative things going forward, issues perhaps we haven't addressed uh, thus far. I know it's been a very wide ranging conversation, but Carolyn, from your perspective, um, thoughts that, uh, you know, moving forward and then things we haven't perhaps addressed? Yeah, I, I, th I think we've touched on uh, all the key issues, uh, but um, uh, maybe just reinforcing uh, on, on the issue of funding that even maybe thinking around a, 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 a pool of a, a, fund, a, a fund, an African uh, uh, fund uh, for investigative journalism uh, that could also help to, to alleviate some of these uh, uh, funding challenges, especially because it keeps coming up. And also just to say that uh, collaborations, as we have seen, uh, uh, the benefits outweigh uh, the, the risks and the, and, and the challenges. So I think just to say uh, people need to, to, to press on and uh, capitalize and uh, uh, take advantage of the, the expertise that is even within the African continent uh, to, 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 to do more, more such uh, collaborative, uh, high impact investigation. Okay, no, thank you for that, Carolyn. And, and one thing I will say on funding that we believe in strongly at CCIJ is I know there can be an attitude and a practice of sometimes, well, the, the scale of African economies sometimes aren't quite as much as in Europe or the United States. So let's pay people in Africa less. And we, we are not doing that, uh, both inside our team and then also uh, with, with, the, with the colleagues with whom we work and, and learn from, that we, we actually believe it's very important uh, to bring an equitable uh, and equal uh, pay approach um, to, to the work that we do. So I just wanted to, to share that. Um, so th thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Carolyn. Final thoughts before we uh, kind of synthesize. Anybody want to want to get in? I know we've covered a, a really wide range of topics, and we have at least started to hit on the, the kind of items that we identified in in uh, in the um, tip sheet, which again I I shared. I'm happy to share again. But anybody final thoughts before we wrap up? Any, anybody else? Yeah, I just wanted to say that I think another thing that would help the community and especially those of us um, who are freelancers is to see if um, CCIJ can have some kind of partnerships with newsrooms in the mm -hmm. countries where um, our members exist so that um, publishing, having your stories published is not a problem because if you have a partnership with a newsroom, they already understand what kind of stories you'll be writing that's um we say in nigeria wets the ground you know for whatever potential stories are coming up and um, i think we'll have more journalists forthcoming especially those who are freelancers and do not have um, fixed platforms that they publish for i think this would also help you know the kind of stories that we want to publish you know, be published as they should be published no, th thank you very much for that vanessa and i will just put in the chat um, here is our link to membership, and so we do welcome uh, people joining our community. Carolyn is 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 uh, a one one of our first uh, paying members, and we do want to be sensitive to people's situations. So we do have uh, membership uh, fee adjustments or waivers entirely. Uh, but no, we we welcome that. Thank you very much for that suggestion. And we will have with CCIJ a a kind of community meeting to hear from membership about what. You know what people want to do uh, in this upcoming year and how we can be working more effectively to work with and learn from uh, the community. So thank you very much for that. Uh, it looks like Evelyn wanted to say something and then Steve, yes? Yeah, yeah very Evelyn? quickly. Yeah. Um, we at the um, same thing. Um, we have uh, had a partnership with Daily Trust and Premium Times and um, well, in, in 10 countries or so, uh, the stories have also been co-published. Uh, that is, is it's normal practice uh, for us, which I think is something we definitely want to continue. And maybe if we join forces, we can make that more structural and, 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 and do it all the time. But I want to add publishing internationally 
uh, our founding, uh, the first founding member, Idris Akinbajo, said it um, ages ago. Our leaders listen more when stories are published in the West. Uh, this is not because stories published in the West are better, but because the leaders are not so much concerned about their own public. They are really concerned about the image uh, in the West because that's where all the donor money comes from. So we really need to uh, reach out globally. No, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you raised that, Evelyn. And before we just zip over to Steve, that is one of the things that we're excited about at CCIJ is that we're very fortunate to have other members in our community like Winston Mowale in Malawi, uh, who does Africa Brief, Emmanuel Dog Bevy, who does Ghana Business News, uh, Ray uh, Joseph brokered a standing relationship with Daily Maverick. Um, so, so our stories uh, almost automatically go to multiple countries. Um, and then we do have some relationships with outlets in, in the United States, a little more preliminary uh, to do some of that as well, as well as country specific. So uh, of course we need to get better about then compensating the journalists for that. And so that it's not just a, well, the value is republication, but, but I do agree with you strongly, Evelyn, that the more uh, these stories circulate, the larger the possibility for impact is, and then making some of these connections and identifying similar and common themes. So Steve, and I think Sonia wanted to say something. Yes, Steve, final thoughts? Uh, just that collaborative journalism and investigative journalism and collaborative journalism generally is long past you. I mean, it's, the, the, it's, it's long ago we needed to drop the 20th century idea of of competing publications and competing amongst each other as journalists. There's so much more that can be achieved with collaboration. And I just want to say thank you to the CCIJ for, for using the resources that you have to, to initiate this. Um, and, and I'm sure it'll, it'll, it'll go from strength to strength. Also, the ability through collaboration to, to bring to bear um, information on, on, on a topic such as climate change, for instance, a Pan-African newsroom could collaborate to show how climate change is impacting communities in Nigeria, in Kenya, in South Africa, which would have a much greater impact um, than, than, yeah, just, just a story, for instance, from Namibia on, on, on a small aspect. And it could really, really brings the ability to, to, to create a bird's eye view together with the voices of the community, that, that very important uh, juncture. So thank, thank you. No, no, th thank you. Really stirring words, Steve, and, and a broad vision that Evelyn, you know, put on the table. One of the things that we're excited about is that we have published on water in, in, in close to 10 African countries, but also, to your point, Steve, in Asia, in Latin America, in, in, no in North America. And, and some of these stories are about uh, a big farming industry that, uh, that dominates the local community and pollutes it. Are we in Asia? Are we in Africa? Are we in North America? Are we in all three? And then what can we, what can we do by bringing those out? So no, thank you so much, Sonia. Over to you, and then then we'll we'll pull it up because I want to be mindful of time, Sonia. No, basically, I just wanted to to comment on what uh, Evelyn said about African leaders, uh, you know, being worried or actually concerned about the image only when stories are published internationally. Uh, I, I like that point, and uh, I think uh, you know you you are brutal or honest on on, on that part. Um, I and I just wanted to share an example of of, of a story that um, you know we have been working um, for years. I think it. it, it for, for about four years, we've been reporting. I don't know if you guys have picked up the fish rod scandal in Namibia, uh, where uh, politicians such as ministers, you know, they, they, they actually manipulated the law to, to, to you know, to sell uh, fish uh, to Icelandic companies uh, mm. in exchange for, for bribery. We have been running that story for a very long time from scratch. And, you know, Namibian leaders and even the president himself who is involved, is, is, they are just quiet. They don't do nothing. Nothing is being done. But when Al Jazeera actually took the story, that, that's when they really started panicking. You know, the president fired the ministers, you know, all these kind of things. Now they are in jail. So it, it just also shows, uh, um, in, you know, on the part of, in, 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 of the CCIJ as, as a collective, 
um, that that that's the power of 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 collaborative work. If 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 it, the, the the same example can be that can can also be said about the story I did with the CCIJ on the grapes farming. So it, it's only when really they see that the story is out there, you know, that they are, they get concerned. But if it was just published in the in the in the local newspapers, I, I don't think that community could have actually been provided with access to clean water. You know, it would just be another thing, and then yeah. So um, thank you for that, uh, raising that actually. And uh, it just shows that we need to continue um, collaborative work. We should work together and just uh, keep going. Um, I think collaborative work is actually the future of journalism. Thank you very much, Sonia. And what a, what a fitting way uh, to close. Uh, and, and thank you very much, Sonia, Jason, Carolyn, Steve, Vanessa, Evelyn, you know, thank you all very much. I'm, I'm really honored to be on, on the conversation with you and very excited to see what we can really figure out to do together going forward. So, uh, Carolyn, I know you mentioned following up. I think we really have some energy and momentum behind this Pan-African virtual newsroom. So uh, plenty more to do. Thank you all very much. And we are ending right on time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Okay. That's it.